come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> Hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. We're a movie talk show that comes your way every Saturday, whether you're ready for it or not. Hey, do us a favor. Wherever you found us, go over and give us a like or a star rating or give us a review. All of that stuff helps us get found by other like-minded folks like you who are into the same stuff that we're into, which is awesome and sometimes weird and sometimes big and sometimes little movies. Uh, these yeah, are what's, what's, what's your kink? <laughs> well, these are the internet radio superstars. Holly, Michaela, Sean, and I'm Colin. And tonight we watched a movie that was chosen by you. That's right. This is the That's culmination right, of uh, our uh, listener choice month voting. Uh, block we do this every year this is kind of an annual thing that we follow up uh in the first month of the new year we uh we appreciate you guys listening to us like seriously uh and so um you know if this is your first rodeo then we you know take some suggestions we put them all on a list we put up a poll you guys get to vote and so we're gonna watch the top four vote getting movies uh for the next four weeks starting today so that's yeah that's how much we love you our gift to you because we love you well i'm actually kind of surprised because uh tonight's movie is like a um a very well-known movie and maybe that's uh, i think most of the films that you're about to hear us do are probably fairly well known in uh, in the horror and sci-fi circles um tonight's movie who wants to tell us what it is i think you should colin Okay. If I, I would say if anybody lays claim to this movie, I think it's you. Well, that might All be right. true. I'll, I'll ask. I'll ask. Colin, what did we watch tonight? <laughs> tonight we watched John Carpenter's Big Trouble in Little China. Probably that's what we. Well, I'd say that's what we need because Colin's just like somebody take this, please. Somebody take this <laughs> intro me, please. Now we'll I have to go. This. We'll I go around the table the for the next side. one. Yeah. Uh, this is from the year Holly, 1986. A lovely year. That's right. And it was, of course, directed by John Carpenter, because this is the thing that we know about our listeners is they like some John Carpenter. uh, We've done so much in the past year. Where was their love for Escape from L.A.? <laughs> where was your love? That loves that movie. Where was your love? <laughs> it's you, only you. Yeah. But we also did you found Christine. It. You were the one person, <laughs> right? We did Christine uh, last last listener's choice month. I think. No, no, no. no that no. was a Holly pick. It was, was, like, it was the yeah. fog. The fog was the fog. Yes. The fog was yeah. a listener choice. That's right. And we did John Carpenter's Body Bag. So we are very slowly working through through the maestros. Uh, right. We've done Village of the Damned. Yep. We did In the Mouth of Madness. In the Mouth of Madness. We've done They Live. Did we do They Live? I was not here. We talked about him on our Halloween 2 episode. True. We talked about him in our version of the the Thing episode. That's right. We did the... The the, the The new one. Yeah, what do you call it? It's not a remake. It's a sequel. It's a shit, Colin. It's a prequel, actually, so... Yeah. Oh, that's right. Sorry, it was a prequel. Um, so John Carpenter, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, we've been talking about him a lot, so you can go back and hear uh, uh, our our thoughts on the man, the myth, the legend. Who is he? Is John- a pillar. He is a pillar holding up our wall. That's very true. Um, John Carpenter. Most, I think uh, we. What, sorry. None. Well, we were talking about it on the last episode. It's like there's a feeling that I've always had that John Carpenter is a guy who kind of landed in the horror genre uh, because Halloween was so successful, right? But um, the horror may not be his first love in in cinema. No, definitely no, not. This, so do we, and this, this movie is kind of, I mean, it's kind of his interpretation of his first love, right? Which is the Western. So this was because this was supposed to be a Western, wasn't it? Yeah. Tell me about that. You know, you know about that? I've read a little bit about it. Uh, I know it was supposed to be like an 80s Western, uh, which it kind of is in some aspects, but it definitely morphed into his wheelhouse, which has become horror. And uh, he said he's always want to make a karate movie. So, yeah, I would definitely watch this as a Western. Oh, for sure. 
Yes. Well, apparently the studio didn't agree with you, Michaela, unfortunately. I mean, it would have been kind of cool, but it was written by a guy named uh, Gary Goldman and another guy named David. I'm sorry, I have completely forgotten his name. Um, it was in, set in the 1880s or 1899, and it was a Western that took place in San Francisco in Chinatown. And uh, the, the studio ah. said there's too much oriental mysticism here and in an underground thing and then we're like coming back you know modern day or, or sorry uh, and then it's a period film and then it's a you know and it's a western and this is just too much we got to update this and make it at least modern so modern audiences can kind of buy into this thing it's, mm. it's like on the it's like on the one hand i feel like at this point the western hadn't evolved into more possibilities so i can see their point but they were totally missing the potential they could have they could have started something with a mystical western like that would have been amazing i feel like if that idea had been pitched 10 years later it would have gotten made yeah yeah there's a lot of about this movie i think is kind of ahead of its time Mm. um because uh, even- been, now, just like you describing it being like chinatown san francisco and like the gold rush that would have been so fucking cool yeah, that was the thing they yep. kept. That was the thing they kept. They said was basically the the low pan uh, storyline was kept from the original script. Everything else was kicked out. And um, I think, you know, as you guys were saying, I think for Westerns, like the Western was dead pretty much the only. But the year before 1985 uh, was the year that we had both uh, Silverado, which was Lawrence Kasdan. The guy who wrote uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark and Empire Strikes Back. He made this big like kitchen sink Western, which is like an ode to the old Hollywood Western. It's probably one of the greatest. We- I like it a lot because it is like the definitive uh, like well, this is the Hollywood Western. And uh, we also had Clint Eastwood. He came back and did uh, uh, Pale Rider. So those were the, that was really, you know, where the Western was. And I don't think the Western really like was really reinvigorated until like Dances with Wolves. And then after the success of that, like everybody had to make a Western, you know? Yeah. Um, but the other thing at play here is um, the Chinese martial arts movie. Um, what do you guys, do you guys have any like experience with this, uh, like massive, massive genre of, uh, of films, Chinese martial arts? Minimal. Yeah. This is my wheelhouse. (laughs) Not mine either, but we've, uh, we, I mean, we've covered, uh, uh, I mean, probably in the, in the whole spread of things, probably not a lot, but we've covered a, a few shining examples of the genre on this podcast before um yeah, it's always it's fun hard. it's always enjoyable to watch because like as far as like chinese martial arts movies like i don't know how extensive we've gotten into that but we've definitely watched a lot that has been influenced by that we've watched a lot of like the 90s martial arts movies on the show i have brought more than my fair share mm-hmm. um don't glare at me sean they've been great um but like I don't know how extensive we've gone into like the actual like Chinese cinema of martial arts. Yeah, because there's I actually the last year because I mean this is like a big deficit in my uh, filmic uh, you know experience. There's uh, I mean because the Chinese has have a very functional uh you know film industry that basically cranks these things out obviously bruce lee came out of it in the the 1970s there's uh, a huge amount of stuff i mean usually you know like the 37th chamber of shaolin that's a good one uh you know stuff like that the five deadly venoms and these movies would play in america but they were like basically relegated to the grindhouse uh, inner city grindhouses i don't even know if these made it to like um you know like drive-ins in the rest of the country they were pretty much um it seems like, you know, New York Times Square kind of things. And um, all of them basically employ like, you know, a lot of martial arts. And uh, there's always like a guy coming from the Shaolin Temple who's, you know, and gets into a, a thing somewhere. I mean, they're basically the Chinese version of the Western. Mm-hmm. Right. So <laughs> which is where the, the Japanese had the samurai uh, films. Uh, these are like these countries, which is ironic because the uh, the British, they don't have the Western. They have the gothic horror movie. That's their Western, mm. right? <laughs> but the other guys, they got uh, they got these uh, martial arts movies. So there's uh, the 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 martial arts movie here. I think really became like a thing um, 
with the release of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, right? So that was in the oh, 90s. Yeah. And then there's this huge wave and in interest in uh, in Chinese uh, martial arts movies. We're bringing over movies like Hero and yes. um, what was the House of the Flying Daggers? And like, yeah. you know, and then video companies started getting a hold Red of them. Cliff. Red well, yeah, yeah, yeah. The John Woo movie. I mean, there's there's yep. a ton of them now that you can find. The Ip Man movies are kind of recent and all this other stuff. Oh, yeah. But that's the thing about Big Trouble in Little China. Predated all this. I mean, it's like it's 10 years ahead of its time, and it was a huge bomb when it came out, unfortunately. Uh, it came out in the summer of 86, and it was uh, bookended, I think, uh, uh, if I remember correctly. I remember 20th Century Fox had The Fly aliens and big trouble in little china all came out that year and uh big trouble in little china was basically seen I mean, the way i remember it as a as a kid when it came out was like it was gonna be the next like indiana jones and the temple of doom right which had come out two years prior but i mean even when you look at some of the set design and stuff like that at the end of this movie it's like the temple of doom but with neon Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and, I, and, um, and didn't I don't I remember reading that um, the production of this was like rushed to be finished early because Eddie Murphy had the Golden Child coming out and they wanted to beat that release because it was very similar. And everyone's like, well, everyone loves Eddie Murphy, so that's going to rule the box office. Yeah, Eddie Have Murphy. You seen at the, the Golden time. Child? Have you seen it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've seen it. No, yeah. I've never seen this. <laughs> well, it's uh, there's a snake lady in it. I'll give you that. <laughs> and Charles Dance playing the bad guy, Sardo Numsa. Oh, I remember. Right. He, can turn into, he can turn into rats and stuff. It's uh, it's fun. So it's a mystical kind of oriental thing. Like the kid in that, the golden child is like the um, Dalai Lama or something. He's like, you know, mystical yeah, kid in the, he's special. Yeah. Is there a lot of martial arts in that? You got to refresh my memory. I haven't seen that since like 1986. But I mean, is it a martial arts movie? I don't think so. It's more like he's a he's a cop in that movie, and he's trying to find the kidnapping and all that stuff. I don't think so. There's definitely more in this movie. Yeah, and the Golden Child was a big deal because Eddie Murphy was like a superstar coming off of uh, you know like Beverly Hills Cop and all that, and I think mm -hmm. that was two years before. Um, John Carpenter was coming off of Starman. Have you guys seen Starman? No, I've, I've, but I'm man. familiar Not with forever. it, but I, I haven't I watched it. I never hear player. anything good about Starman. Never. <laughs> Starman has one of the best performances uh, I think Jeff Bridges has ever given in his life. It's a, you know, because he plays like a, a, an alien that's in a human form. Yeah. And he just, just him acting, he's trying to, you know, like experience what it's like to be a human. It's like very, like you believe that guy's an alien, you know? Yeah. It's a really well, good I think movie. he's. I mean, I think he's an alien anyway. I mean, <laughs> most likely. Alien? I don't just, know. Just fucking a, looked like one oh, yeah. in that Tron movie. Just a weed oh, yeah. smoking alien is what that guy is. <laughs> like, he came down here. The first thing he found was weed. And he's like, I'm never going back. I mean, I agree. He's definitely not mortal. I'll give you that. <laughs> well, there's that. Yeah. That's the thing. People who had an issue with um, some of the effects in the Mandalorian, go back and watch Tron Legacy and tell me what you think. Yeah, with the uh, the head replacement of young young Jeff Bridges as they were trying to do that, <laughs> terrifying, uh. absolutely terrifying. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean Carpenter's career tra trajectory. Um, you know, after I mean, because basically it's what it, uh, he had three massive hits in a row. I think which was uh, Halloween, The Fog, and Escape from New York, and then he did, went studio and he made uh, the thing remake for universal which was a huge bomb in 1982 and is now regarded as like one of the a the greatest one of the greatest horror movies one of the greatest science fiction movies one of the greatest sci-fi horror movies ever made <laughs> one of the greatest <laughs> remakes ever made yeah yeah exactly also true it yeah. is generally thought of as better than the the original movie um it and, is definitely better than the original movie <laughs> and i think after that they're not even really the same movie no, no it's no. it's totally different yeah, because he's going back to the source. Well, but I like it when they do that. Like, if you're going to remake the movie, you know, it's like, you know, oh, yeah. don't give me the exact same movie, which is unfortunately the prequel basically is the same movie. But you can hear our podcast on there. Oh, don't say that. 
Don't um, say it's the same movie. How dare you? <laughs> well, he did. <laughs> then he moved over to Columbia Pictures. He made two movies for them. That was uh, 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 Christine, which I think was well regarded because it was a Stephen King adaptation. Stephen King was a big deal at the time. And then Starman, which was like, this is a John Carpenter movie? from the guy who made Halloween. He's making like this sci-fi romance, a kind of a, you know. Uh, it's like a delicate movie, you know, uh, it's, it's Is it good. His bridges, bridges of Madison County. Yeah. But it's not what you would expect from John Carpenter. You know what I mean? But right. I don't think big trouble, in little China would be either. Doesn't feel like it. No, no, there was very few. There's very few moments in this that I thought, okay, that's John Carpenter. Very few moments. It felt more a little like, uh, it looked like Tommy Lee Wallace visually, but that's really? the, the Dean Cundy yeah. of it all. Yeah. But this felt more like, uh, maybe it's just the difference in time. This felt more like Halloween three than it felt like, you know, another John Carpenter movie. But you could feel the Dean Cundy, although. Is this the last movie that, uh, Dean Cundy, he's the cinematographer. Is this the last movie that Dean Cundy did with John Carpenter? Damn good question. I'll look it up. I think it is because after this, uh, the, the the failure of this movie at the box office, because I think they were kind of positioning this movie as like, this is going to be the Indiana Jones movie of 1986. It's going to be a huge, you know, colossal hit. Everybody likes Kurt Russell. You know, it's action adventure. It looks like Temple of Doom. Um, and then when it failed, which Carpenter and Kurt Russell, I think on some of the commentary tracks are blaming the studio for not supporting it, which I think the studio didn't know what to do with it. Cause they were like, Oh, you know, we don't quite understand this movie to market it appropriately to bring in the yeah. audience. And so, um, yeah, cause I remember seeing that like test audiences really liked this movie. So Kurt Russell was convinced he's like, this is it. This is going to be huge. And then saw absolutely no marketing for it. Yeah, because I just I don't even remember if I remember trailers. I mean, again, it depends on what you were watching at the time. But I do remember like, you know, seeing the um, like the Fangoria article, you know, behind the scenes. And I remember seeing the poster art and stuff like that and being intrigued by it. And it's like, oh, it's John Carpenter. I think uh, when I met him, that was the thing that I asked him was, um, you know, it's like usually on your posters, you have John Carpenter's. um, uh, but what movies have you not had that on? Because uh, what was it? I think like Memoirs of an Invisible Man doesn't say it. And he said Big right. Drum in Little China, I think was the other one. It's funny you say that, Colin, because a friend of mine, when he met him at a convention, he had like a, a poster of the thing he wanted him to sign. But it was like a like an artist poster done by someone else. And uh, he, he was taking pictures of John Carpenter, like unrolling it to sign it. And the poster said, John Carpenter's the thing. And John Carpenter got really mad at him. He's like, where'd you get this from? I didn't authorize this. I didn't say this was my movie. And so like he has these picture progressions of John Carpenter getting like slightly <laughs> angry and yelling at him. <laughs> oh, wow. That's better uh, than an autograph. <laughs> I think it, that it does funny. on the poster. Doesn't it say John Carpenter's the thing? I, I don't know, but I think it, the issue was that this was like an artist's poster mm. and not like an official movie poster. Right. So right. his name was on like a creation that was someone independent. Yeah. His, his name is not on the thing and it's not on Big Trouble in Little China. It is in the credits, though. John Carpenter's Big Trouble in Little China. Yeah, and on the screen. Thing. Yeah, yeah, on screen, it's still his. Okay. Um, and Dean Cundy, the last one together was this movie. Um, so this was their last project together. Uh, in looking up Dean Cundy's thing, I did notice he shot, uh, big business and nothing but trouble. So, uh, <laughs> the same year, that poor man, he's probably not, not the same person anymore. after shooting <laughs> no, that movie. It, it, he can't be, I'm just finding it funny that he shot big business. There is no way that he hasn't had years and years of therapy because of nothing but trouble. I've had did, therapy because of nothing but trouble. <laughs> did nothing but trouble get onto our list, like to vote for? No, they no, must no love suggestions. <laughs> for nothing wow. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Just went right past everybody. But see, that's the thing. If it's you, up to me. If you talk about a movie long Sean, enough. I will end you. I'm not even <laughs> kidding. <laughs> all right. You all prepare because it's coming at some point. I yeah. don't know if I can ever eat hot dogs again because of that movie. Like, I think it ruined hot dogs for me. <laughs> Guys, it it's the 30th anniversary this year. Oh, it ruined the shit. Android for me. Well, oh, yeah, damn. I can see that. It's 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 it definitely the worst thing he's ever done. Yeah, you know, and when people 
when people say they, you know, like, oh, Dan Aykroyd has ideas for Ghostbusters 3. And like, so you just need to like, let him make it. No. Have you seen nothing but trouble? Don't fucking let him make anything like no. that. Have you seen his weird YouTube videos of, with about the crystal skulls? Like, no, don't let and them do these alien theories with the yeah. one where he's like smoking in the hotel room and like that's just, what I mean. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't let it don't let him do anything. <laughs> Wasn't he the host of the Sci Factor back in the Sci Factor? I, he, didn't Jonathan Frakes host Sci Factor? Oh, I can't remember. Um, I, I, that, that was Dan Aykroyd has a thing for the the unexplained and the and the unknown. Um, but we mentioned Dean Cundy because Dean Cundy and John Carpenter together, like those are generally the John Carpenter movies. Uh, they have a certain look that, you know, I mean, I guess is attributed, uh, attributable to Dean Cundy. And once the two of them kind of, uh, went their separate ways, Carpenter's output changed, uh, in its look. And I think, uh, you know, nothing that he's done since big trouble in little China has really been like, uh, you know, the the great john carpenter stuff yeah um interesting you know but uh i think maybe this might be at the end of the uh the 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 peak john Par- john carpenter um the the studio had uh, wd richter come in and rewrite the movie he's the guy who got rid of everything except for the low pan stuff wd richter uh also wrote um the invasion of the body snatchers remake he wrote the dracula remake with frank langella and i believe he wrote and directed a movie called the adventures of buckaroo bonsai across the eighth dimension uh so wd richter has a uh, uh interesting filmography so he updated it to modern day right uh san francisco chinatown i don't know uh, like i heard that they uh, they looked at um oh god who was it uh instead of kurt russell uh for the lead bill paxton no it was somebody bill no it wasn't like schwarzenegger or stallone but i mean maybe clint eastwood or something like that i can't remember but uh, uh that, that might be completely wrong but this movie like lives on its ca- like this is a very well cast movie i think i mean am i wrong on that no it's a good cast the The thing that kurt russell is doing here uh i think everybody has said and i I think you can see it right and we're going with that western theme in escape from new york he was channeling clint eastwood right snake plissken is a variation on clint eastwood but jack burton is john wayne right is he doing like a john wayne inflection I didn't get that sense. Yeah, I mean, I I can see someone interpreting it as a modernized John Wayne um, because he's kind of like the the grizzled, like almost every man, but like heroic every man. So, like in that respect, I can see it. It argued that he's a modernized version of it. Well, he's but got I the swagger. Like he- yeah he's well he he, yeah and he is trying you can you can hear it in the way he like rounds some of his words that make it sound like a a little bit like a john wayne but he's 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 trying to be a square jawed like american dude like he's just trying to be like you said swagger like that's what he's trying to go for yeah see i I find john wayne very bland and like the antithesis of charming so i feel like kurt russell could completely coast on just his charming nature and still be more compelling than john wayne you know yeah that's that's why i'm like i can see the argument trying to be made but i feel like well maybe i'm specifically stretch. talking about like a, a vocal rhythm more than the actual trying to adopt the characterization he does this in death proof uh even more he leans into it you know some people say i got a black book but i actually have a black but you know i mean that's like an extension it feels like of what he's doing vocally he's in this do- movie yeah. then he's doing it a lot because that's kurt russell too like that's just the way he delivers a line yeah but but he's but he's kurt russell though so he can do that like he's good at that so the the thing about this movie okay my initial experience with it when I saw it in 86, um, I was not a giant fan of it, like right out the door. And I wonder if it has something to do with this. Um, Jack Burton is not the hero of this movie. Uh, true or false? It's Wang. Yeah, it really, sh- it, it's Wang because it's Wang's movie and it really should just be about him. Right. But, but it's funny because it's like Wang's, it's like there's another movie going on with just Wang. 
Yeah. And I feel like we could have followed him and done another movie. It's like seeing yeah. the same thing from two different well, perspectives. No, Sean, I feel like we could have sh- done that. No, the movie should be Wang's movie because it's his fiance that gets taken. Like the, the, the like Jack Burton is really shoehorned into this story. Yeah. He well, is the I sidekick. Mean, wasn't it, wasn't yeah. it Carpenter's intention that they were both the hero, that they were like equal parts in this movie? Mm, yeah, but I mean, off that way. I don't think it comes off that way because uh, when, when I any, think that was what he initially wanted. And then the studio was like, Kurt Russell's your star. Well, there was a, I know that there was a, um, Kurt Russell's the short round in this. Yes. He, <laughs> I, I think so. Because any moment of action that takes place in this movie, uh, Kurt Russell, ends up losing his weapon and has to go chase for it. And by the time he gets back, like Wang and his buddies have like kicked everybody's ass or Kurt yeah, Russell, like, like charges into battle, shooting his gun at the ceiling and knocks himself out when the uh, bricks fall on his head and misses the beginning of the battle. He's always right? like, <laughs> it's been, yeah. And Wang, Wang is going through the hero's journey because mm-hmm. he starts out in a certain spot and then he ends up doing like, 20 flips when he comes into a room. Like it's like it was going on in the background all the time, always there. They just didn't focus on him. They just said, this movie's about the sidekick. Yeah. He's going through the big journey over here, but we're going to focus on Kurt Russell. Yes. Yeah. This is a subversive movie where they're yes. like, you're going into it thinking you're getting Indiana Jones, but you're actually getting <laughs> the sidekick and mm-hmm. Wang. Uh, Wang Chi, I'm not sure what his last name is, I think it's Wang is Chi. your protagonist of the movie. He's the guy who's driving the plot. Now, I think, like I said, subconsciously as a kid, I registered this in some way that it was like the hero of the, the, the hero of the movie, right? Which is set up by the scene that the studio insisted that Carpenter put in at the beginning, which is uh, in the lawyer's office where the guy, you know, and Egg Shen is saying, like, we owe jo- Jack Burton a, a debt because he showed great courage. Like, there's no, nowhere in the movie where he's, like, being especially courageous. <laughs> um, maybe that's not fair. Is Jack Burton a courageous man? Yeah. yeah. Okay. For sure. Okay. He's, he's, he's a screw-up, yeah. but, yeah, he's courageous. But, yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, yeah, he's still running in, like, fighting people and all that. He's still going yeah. in. He doesn't have to. He could leave. He d- he doesn't hesitate. He's like, let's do this. Like, yeah. we're here. Let's do this. But he, I mean, he fucks up the whole movie, but he's still there trying. He's just right? way, way, way over his head in something he completely doesn't understand. So yeah. I guess you can relate to him that way. You know, he's like your audience participation character who's getting you that's, into this, like, unfolding layers makes, of the Chinese under or the Chinatown underworld. That's what <laughs> makes it enjoyable. That's what makes it so charming. Yeah. I think so. I think this is a, he's got a, he does a great performance here. I mean, like his comedic timing is impeccable. There's a lot of comedy um, yeah. in that. I part. like the, uh, I like the call the president line. Um, I don't, I never <laughs> remembered that from this movie, <laughs> but that's it. If we're not back by Don, call the president. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. There's Very something good. wrong with your face. Uh, that was, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think Kurt Russell's the, the, the like this is one of his great, you know, like character uh, uh that he's the characters that he's ever played. Um we've also got um well, it's Dennis Dunn as um Wang Wang Chi. I think he was in the year of the dragon like the year before. I think that was a Michael Cimino movie. Uh that you know, nobody sees Michael Cimino movies apparently except the Deer Hunter, but um I think James Hong was also in uh, Year of the Dragon, I said Under the Dragon. Year of the Dragon, I meant. Um, James yeah. Hong um, plays the evil villain Lo Pan. Um, James Hong, according to MF Mad, the keeper of the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame, has been inducted into or onto the wall. Uh, oh, really? Did did we watch Balls of Fury to get him on there? Did no. We, uh... <laughs> Do you okay. know what we did watch? What it starred uh... James Hong. Shit. No, he could be in there anywhere. Okay, well, he was in Tango and Cash. Okay. He was in Big Trouble in Little China, and Uh he was in the Deathless classic Ninja 3, The Domination. Ah. That's right. Yes. Of course, it's a canon movie. Yes. (laughs) James Hong's in a lot of shit. I mean, he is basically your go-to Chinese-American guy. He was in all those three Ninja movies. 
Yeah, he was. And you'll probably remember if you saw Blade Runner, he's the guy who makes your eyes. He make I make your eyes. You know, that's him. Um, Kurt Russell, we're also inducting into the uh, Wall of Fame for the first time because of Big Trouble in wow. Little China, Tango and Cash, and Sean. Sean. Oh, yeah. Uh, escape from LA. There you go. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, Colin, I'm waiting with rapt attention. Please tell me the third movie. <laughs> That's right. All right. So, Mr. Russell and Mr. Hong, your uh, you know the certificates are in the mail. Well, when you're all, all when you're all already staring at me, I can't tell when you're staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Can't wait until we get back together in 2021, right? and we're able to do uh, we're not this show. Know again. how to act? <laughs> no, we're all going to be in the same room, just shouting at loud decibels because we don't know how to speak around people anymore. I'm going to be trying to find the mute button all the time on myself. <laughs> Holly's just in the corner. I don't know what's going on. Well, Why am got, I delirious uh, in this, in this <laughs> I don't know. Wait, no, Michaela should be the one going. She's the one sitting back. Well, who else is in our cast in this movie? Uh, Peter uh, Kwong. And who does he play? He plays the lovely herbal essence commercial model in this movie. Mm. God, I hope that's his real hair. It is not his real hair, um, but I do know a little tidbit about this. He had a lifelong dream of having long, luxurious hair. So <laughs> when he found out he was going to have it in this movie, he was so stoked. And he was proud to sit in a makeup chair for three hours to have this wig put on every day. He was so excited. And I think that's adorable. Didn't they say this was uh, like a three three $3,000 wig $3, or something? That, yeah. Wig, yeah. Ooh, yeah, It's pretty. Well, it's, it is it's probably like real soft, like horse hair from some exotic. It looked part like of the world. horse hair. That like, looked like a tail. Like it makes it makes that scene when he takes his helmet off and flips his hair even better. I love it now. You, you guys remember that uh, that the rock version of Hercules that came out a couple years ago? Yeah, yeah. Remember the fact everyone knew from this movie was that it was ox testicle hair that made up his fake beard. <laughs> Really? Did they tell him that? In that, movie? <laughs> that was like I'm the only curious. thing I heard about that movie. Never heard if it was good or bad. Just heard he had ox testicle hair on his face. <laughs> I think Colin did because when you mentioned it, he went, "Yeah." No, I was like, "Wow, well, <laughs> well, okay, well, there you go. Wow, it's, uh, you learn something new every. That's why you listen to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. You get little right? tidbits and knowledge. Even I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm learning stuff. I love it. Well, um, he would be one of the three storms. They are, uh, aside from Lopan, who is a uh, mystical 2,000-year-old ghost who lives in uh, in Chinatown. Uh, maybe somebody, one of you can explain to me that what, what, who is Lopan and what is he after, our villain? Oh, shit, I forgot. Oh, he, a, wo a woman with green eyes? Why? He needs a woman with green eyes so he can become mortal again. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like somehow he is because we see him in two guises. Basically, there is the uh, David Lopan or sorry, there's the Lopan character, which is this very tall Chinese guy in, uh, you know, ceremonial uh, accoutrement. Right. Yeah. Um, robes and headdress so he <laughs> apparently is the ghost version of uh low pan he can project himself out into the world but he is not made flesh he has some power but it's very limited and in the real world uh he exists as david low pan which is this uh little um you know wrinkly looks like he's 2000 years old guy in a wheelchair right and his mm -hmm. goal in life is to find and marry a chinese girl with green eyes apparently extremely rare and if he can marry her and tame the they can tame the burning blade and uh, reawaken the savage heart or something like that he can be appease the demon who put a curse on him and be made mortal again and take over the world because that's what you do right? take over the yes. world yes and luckily, uh, they do find a woman with creamy jade eyes. Ew. Hate that description. Uh, that was just for you, disgusting. Holly. That was disgusting. That, mm. that, that's not a thing. Creamy jade? Jade is not creamy. Jade it's is not creamy. It's a hard I feel like It's not creamy. It no. can be creamy. Like, no. I get what they mean by creamy. Creamy like, jade? Like pea soup? What it's like sexy jade. jade. Yeah. Like, yeah, projectile vomit, pea soup <laughs> color. That's... No. Jade is a smooth, luxurious, beautiful gem. No cream? Okay, no cream. No cream. 
Well, there's a uh, the, the the movie. You know, it it works in these layers of uh, we're starting at some level of reality and we're going to keep on going down into the the subterranean levels of uh, Chinese mysticism. But um, literally, they the 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 girl with the yeah. green eyes. Yeah, we literally go in and we literally go down. yeah, it's yeah. always down. All it's like the, a video game. The, the hell it of is. the burning oils. The hell of the upside down sinners. The hell of the skinned men. The we hell have many of- hells. <laughs> Was there a hell of being slashed to death by knives? Or I think the so. Hell of slashing knives. Yeah, yeah, the hell of the slashing knives. Yeah. <laughs> Chinese like, have oh, many damn. hells. Um, How about the hell of being shoved into the back of a Pontiac? Because that was hell to watch. Fucking claustrophobia at the yeah. mat. And like we were talking on the jet, this was before they had like the anti theft latch in the trunks. Like this was. She was like. Yeah. Oh, yeah, like, it was very claustrophobic. She was, she was like, she was well, like wedged she could, into that car. She could see through it though. That might, that's gonna I help. don't care. I don't care. Then that raises even more questions, coffin. though, Sean. So people that's, just right. saw a woman in the back of the trunk and didn't yeah. think anything of it. That's like saying that's like being put into a glass coffin and be like, "Well, I can see through it." No, it's no. fine. It's San Francisco. That kind of things happens all the time. Yes, yeah, the '80s in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. San Francisco, Colin. Where guys, where where guy, you know the guys in a gang when he's got those like uh, Jordy LaForge uh, sunglasses cool. on. You know, it's okay, like Ooh. this gang is fucking awesome. I would join and this gang. I like how they only yeah. walk in the three. Like they're shoulder to shoulder wherever they go. Don't yeah. they look like they're from the future though? They look yeah. like they're from like they like they could have like, been in Back to the Future. I yeah. was gonna say they look like um, the uh, thugs. Yeah, Billy Zane yeah. and all them. Yeah. Yeah, the, I'll just thugs. say it all for you, Holly. It's okay. Gruff thugs, gruff thugs. The eighties had a really weird Griff. idea of like, Griff, cause yeah, everything was futuristic in the eighties. And that was like part of it. All your dress, you know, uh, your, uh, fashion was futuristic and your headgear and all this other shit. And the, the punk early two thousands were like that too. Cause it was the new millennium. So, <laughs> yeah, right. That's true. Yeah. Um, so my Lynn is uh, that's yeah, going to be uh, Dennis Dunn's. That's uh, Wang Chi's. That's his uh, fiance, right? And mm-hmm. Jack Burton, the driver of the Pork Chop Express, uh, <laughs> is kind of um, he owe, he's owed a gambling debt, so he gets kind of carried along in this adventure. And they meet Gracie Law, who's played by mm-hmm. the irrepressible Kim Cattrall. <laughs> Kim Cattrall. Yeah, in her in her best Lois Lane. Pretty much Pretty feels much. like yeah. Why didn't why didn't they make her the re- a reporter? Right, we could have gotten rid of a whole character here and just made her the reporter. Yeah, that would have made it. more sense. The other one could go. Yeah, yep. she's a lawyer representing the civil rights of Chinese Americans in uh, Chinatown, but she knows a reporter named Margot, which is uh, I guess like maybe that's a shout out to the shadows, Margot Lane. Uh, she's the reporter, and so there's the the two of them. There's a lot of characters in this to keep there's track a, of. There's a lot of there's a lot of exposition between the two of them. A lot, a lot of obvious exposition, I should say. Right, just like you mean the guy who did this and this yeah. and this. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, yes, that guy who did this then. Yeah, I honestly, I don't want to hear people ever complain about a Christopher Nolan movie like explaining things directly to the audience because this movie is all of that. Jack right. Ryan is literally saying, "Who is that? What does that mean? What is that?" Like, right. especially the at first least, fifteen minutes, he says that a lot. At least Christopher Nolan does that with a little more finesse. Like this was just. But it puts they you in the headspace. They basically should have just pulled out the script and read it to you. Yeah, but this is putting you in the headspace of Jack Burton. It's like there's shit going on and you have no idea. And every single know, person seems to know more about it. Colin, than I does. think that same argument applies to for Christopher Nolan movies, though, too. And people have a problem with it when he does it. Well, the what well, we're just talking about, uh, we had complaints about if you listen to last week's episode, our best and worst, we were talking about Tenet, or Tenet doesn't give you that, uh, you know, the um, the Elliot Page character from uh, uh, Inception who gets stuff explained to her, who is right. the audience sub, you know, um, surrogate there. Um, but the uh, Kim Cattrall, right? Like, I mean, now she is sex in the city, right? That's how everybody knows her. But Porky's? Yeah. I, I like Porky's? her in every every other <laughs> character besides the sex in the city character. Yeah. I, know, like, I, I like her. Police Academy. I, yeah, I like her. She's more of a, like, uh, an upbeat, energetic, like, you know, kind of actress it seems in her earlier stuff i haven't seen a lot of it but based on what i have seen i kind of like those characters better they i think i don't know i think i like her her character on sex in the city is is good i feel like that that character was made for her like that's the most natural acting i've ever seen from her 
Which one? The Sex and the City character? Yeah. Or, okay, okay. She does Samantha, fit it perfectly. Samantha Jones in Sex and the City. That she it's she's just so natural at that one. It's her. Okay. She's yeah. also in. Uh, and we Star and we Trek veered off six. on Sex and the City on, <laughs> on the Saturday Night Freak Show, and now we don't know what to do. Uh, Honestly, so never we'll, watched it, so I can't contribute. To this. So let's talk about Mannequin. <laughs> mannequin. Yeah, yeah. See, I've seen that. Now I've seen that. So there we go. Good segue. <laughs> All right, so we've got uh, we've got uh, Jack and uh, and Wing or Wang are like now like uh, trying to peel the layers off of this uh you know subterranean because that's a they go to a brothel uh which is a, f- a funny scene is uh jack that's a funny scene. trying to you know negotiate his way through a brothel um and then they encounter the um the three storms um these guys are kind of significant because they're like the um like the second tier boss of the movie right mm. there's low pan by the way, anybody ever see that Gangnam style parody, Low Pan style, where Dave, James Hong actually comes back and it's about this movie? Low I, Pan I think style. I've seen it. And it's kind uh, of yeah. I have yeah, it, like but se- seven years ago when it came out. Yeah, I yeah, know yeah. it's not. <laughs> um, so uh, the, th- 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 the three storms, then, which I think, if I'm correct, we've got thunder, lightning, and rain, right? Yeah. I, I think we your guy lightning. with the long hair, is he, um, I think he's thunder no isn't thunder is the wind? guy who isn't blows up is no. he thunder or is he like storm or wind or something he's he, thunder it's th- i looked it up it was thunder lightning and rain okay. so now i'm like well, oh he is thunder you're right well no right. thunder he's thunder because uh low pan's like thunder why don't you i thought thunder was the guy who uh inflates himself that's he his is. yeah that's thunder yeah it's so a rain i assume is uh the guy who i i love the you know they all have special powers he can like wield you know knives and stuff on his hands without like they, they become spinning blades and all this stuff oh yeah the spinning the spinning ones yeah yep the other guy rides the lightning down and uh they wear these basket uh, he- uh helmets which um you know i mean we've obviously seen in shogun assassin the japanese uh samurai movie so i'm like that has to be where they got that from right or right because aren't there the three following him with their different claws and everything yeah yep yeah Yeah, that's three is just a lucky number when it comes to bad guys and uh there's a lot been made that uh it's very possible that um which character in mortal Kombat? you guys play mortal Kombat? raiden raiden okay was based on Big Trouble in Little China. Mm-hmm. Probably. Um, I think they said yeah. Shang Tsung was supposed to be based on Lo Pan. And, you know, th- this movie has ten. Which that also, that, that also <laughs> makes, like, I was thinking a lot about Mortal Kombat watching this. I was like, okay, so we've got the three warriors here. So in Mortal Kombat, that's Sub Zero and Scorpion. And then we've got the big bad. Like, it, I don't know. I thought about that a lot during this. Yeah. Um, they end up, uh, and, and Egg Shen is the other like lead character in this. He is a um, San Francisco, or he's a Chinatown tourist truck driver. Uh, Slash sorcerer. <laughs> like, I'm like, sure every, yeah. This makes what sense, but clearly you guys have never been to Chinatown. <laughs> I, 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 have yep. I have not. Do you just drive by and there's just lightning constantly? Yeah. So there's either sorcerers or terminators are showing up left and right. That's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's an exciting place. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I need to go. Every major one. city has one, but I think uh, San I, Francisco I was Chinatown about is that. the. I was watching this. I was counting how many Chinatowns I've been to. How many? I've been I've been to New York, San Francisco, um, Boston, Chicago. Five. I've been to five. Is San Francisco yeah. the biggest? San Francisco's a big one. New York was a big one. Been to New York and Chicago, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. New York is huge. Yeah. Seattle's was bigger than I thought. Well, Eggshen, um, and that's uh, Victor Wong, as we said, the actor. He and Dennis Dunn then starred in Prince of Darkness the next year for Carpenter. After he yes. kind of returned to independent filmmaking, so, <clears throat> said, "Fine, these people wanted me to do horror, so I'll do horror and forego the studio route." But. Um, So, yeah, uh, we're set on a series. So basically, the movie is a set of adventure sequences where you're following the characters into like different set pieces. Right. There's a lot of this. Did you guys ever I mean, were you able to follow this or did it get the feeling of uh, repetition that you were like seeing the same thing over and over and over again? I didn't I didn't necessarily feel like I was seeing the same thing over and over again, but I 
did like lose track of where we were. Mm. I, yeah, yeah it, it felt very like serialized and like, but at the same time, yeah, I, I did lose track of like, wait, why are we doing this thing to get to the end goal? Yeah. It felt like video game levels, really. <laughs> it, it did. It did, yeah. yeah. Yeah, as they negotiate like underwater uh, torture chambers and they find right. themselves in dangerous perils and they're on, we got wheelchair stunts as uh, Jack Burton rolls down a, a hallway, a sloped hallway to a well. And um, many opportunities to just stand up, but doesn't take them. It's a centrifugal force, man. You can't, you can't get up when you're in that chair. But instead, you get. Kurt Russell rolling back and screaming in the top of his lungs for like a good 20 seconds. And I thought that was fantastic. Yeah. It's played for comedic effect. I think, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're having a lot of laughs at Kurt Russell's expense. Yeah. Uh, when watching this movie, they, it wouldn't have been funny if he hadn't been just like shouting profusely the entire time he's rolling back. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, they end up, uh, cause I guess this is the, th- it has a, the structure of the movie takes us down, 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 down into David Lopan's lair, which is like a, uh, it's got a corporate facade. And then as you go down, it's the Chinese underworld. And then we come back out of it again. Um, they escape, but they escape without, um, uh, Mao Lin and gracie law turns out both of them are the two girls with the green eyes and low pans like i'm going to marry them both you know i'll have all this power and so then they have to kind of regroup and then head back in uh so then we're like going back into the <laughs> the bowels of the earth and then we yes. get monsters um because i don't think the first time down we get monsters what do we think of the monsters that we encounter well that one snatches kim Cattrall in the hallway he pops out of the little doorway. Right. And there. Yeah. Now I remember the first time I saw that, I was like, wait, what, what is happening yeah. in this movie now? Right. That's, Cause that's a surprise. <laughs> yeah. Cause did we, before that happened, did we ever see the floating head eyeball head? We saw that after. As that after. Yeah. Cause mm-hmm. then we get that, um, which is uh, pretty interesting. He looks like the, um, anybody played dungeons and dragons. That's the beholder. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it looks like the beholder. It does look like a bunch. This all looks like a bunch of Dungeons and Dragons monsters, here, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know who the furry guy is supposed to be, but he gets a lot of screen time. Although he has he like does. the uh, the visual effects were done by Richard Edlund, who did mm-hmm. like Ghostbusters and Fright Night and all that. But for some yeah. reason, I'm not sure who did the makeup effects. But that looked like the mouth from the Fright Night final. Um, you know, Amy monster kind of with mm. a bunch of fur and stuff on it. And then there's another one that like pops out of a uh, sewer Isn't tunnel. This the dead, right. The, the layer of the dead trees or something like that, where one of the tree things comes out and eats one of the dudes. Yeah. That yeah. is pretty funny. So the movie escalates. I mean, it's always escalating. It seems like, uh, you know, I mean, and it moves like pretty quickly, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it does. And what do you think of Carpenter's score in this? Like uh, how it compares to his other stuff and what, what he was going for here? I liked it. I thought it was fun. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, yeah, it, rompy. it's all, yeah, it's all pretty like, um, it's what it needs to be. Mm-hmm. I don't think it rises up to be any of his best work, but I mean, you know, it's good. It works for the I movie. wouldn't say it. Yeah. I wouldn't say it's memorable, but it's fitting. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a, it's an action score. You know, which is, I guess, unusual for like a guy doing a synth score, synth action score, right? Mm. Because, I mean, he did, I guess, in um, Escape from L.A. would have an action score, which was mostly like a gunslinger kind of Western, you know, guitar thing. Yeah. Um, Because even his prior action movies, I mean, Escape from New York and and Halloween kind of sound similar, but this is a percussive, you know beat this is carpenter and alan howarth you know who would work together before um but it, it avoids uh like uh chinese um like cliche right. music that you might kind of expect from you know an american filmmaker making a movie about you know chinatown it doesn't do that it's more i wouldn't call it rock i don't know what you do how you describe it um, i don't know how do you describe that music video you sent us colin like is that an accurate <laughs> Uh, descriptor for the entire movie as far as music goes because woof. that's right did we say so the music video sean what are you talking about who sings well, the theme Colin, song to the this to is big trouble song. in little china it's a theme song to big trouble in little china and it's sung by john carpenter 
And is that all right? Now we got John Carpenter, Tommy Lee Wallace is the other one in there. Who could forget? Like you couldn't miss that stash of long hair anywhere. And is Alan Howarth the guy on the keyboard? I'm not sure. I because I was thinking, I, is it Nick Castle? Like who are the Coupe de Vils? Right? I haven't uh, done because they I'll look did, it up. There's music in um, Halloween when the, uh, they're driving in the car. It, the one that's not a Blue Oyster Cult. There's a song by the Coupe de Vils credited there. So he's always been the Coupe de Vils. That's his band. <laughs> It is Nick Castle. Um, yeah. So there you go. The guy who played the shape, uh, <laughs> the guy who directed He's jamming on a keyboard for this movie. <laughs> so what do we think Great. of John Carpenter, uh, rock star? I love it. Uh, <laughs> I'll go see him in concert next time he tours. <laughs> only if he wears that jacket. Yeah. It's the only way. It's like, like the Sonny Crockett have- jacket. Yeah, if I'm going to go see John Carpenter in concert, I want outfit changes. Like, I want Beyonce <laughs> level, like, something going on here. And he needs to bring, like, suit, rolled up sleeves, all that stuff. Then I'll be in. Well, the movie finally does culminate in the uh, the Chinese Temple of Doom. I'm going to say that because, yeah. like I said, it looks like it's it looks like a variation on the, the Temple of Doom set. Yeah, t- change it from a cave to a hallway, and that's what it is. Yeah. Um, where we get our big, uh, I know there is like a brawl in an alley, uh, which is a martial arts fight between like, you know, mortal guys. Right. But this is the, oh, immortal. the standoff? are you referring to the Chinese standoff? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what makes it a Chinese standoff? Yeah. Holly, what is making this a Chinese standoff? Well, I'm told it's because they're Chinese. <laughs> I was do you that- now, do you need any more than that? <laughs> I do. You, I do, you want actually. more than that, but you don't I- need it. Yes, I do. I need more than that. Why is it a Chinese standoff? Just because they're Chinese? No. When it's a Mexican standoff, there is something special to that. It's not just because people are Mexican. No, there's a meaning behind that. So What's when you that say meaning? Chinese stand, it's the three. It's the three. So when it's I'm sorry, I think Holly's throwing up gang signs here. <laughs> She's describing these things. She's like, it's the three. I'm just like, whoa, three, whoa. You know, Affiliations, you know. we have none of those here. Okay. Yeah. So I yeah, I just I need more. Okay. I need I need something special to make it like a Chinese stand up like something I don't know I don't know speak for yourself something. Sean I'm in the Lords of Death. Mm. <laughs> All that We're versus the uh, now. the Wang Lords Kings I think or the Wang yeah uh, the, Wang don't, they're not the Wang Kings no it was like the Wind they Kings cannot or be something the like Wang that. Kings <laughs> um but the uh, I mean having now watched several um you know, like Chinese martial arts movies, it is kind of, it's interesting. Well, you, even you've seen the stuff that, that came after this, it's like, mm-hmm. this is a pretty good martial arts scene, right? I mean, enough to say, how really was like, it. is it too late to take martial arts? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. This, this was good. It was, uh, it was fun. Like I, the fighting was good. All the impact was good. Dudes were getting their arms like all bent up. Like it's, it's, it's always fun when you start a, a Chinese standoff. <laughs> with a gunfight and then go to the weapons and right, hand-to-hand that's why, combat. That's why I was asking. I was like, is that what makes such a Chinese standoff that they start with like pulling out, like the one dude's got holsters and he's got like a full, like, yeah, and he's got, he's got six shooters. He's got yeah. six yeah. shooters. He looks and like he stepped out of the like West. Yeah. And I was like, what is happening here? And then after they use up all their ammo, then it's like, okay, now knife fight and like hand-to-hand yeah. combat. I'm like, is this what makes it a Chinese standoff that they go from weapons to hand on hand? Like, is that what it is? Let's say yes. Listener, Until we are someone says otherwise. asking you who are more versed in uh, Chinese martial arts movies than us to tell us. But so this is bookended by the big you know, conflict at the end, um, which employs some cool visual things. I was like, is he is Carpenter riffing on like um, uh, animation or anime? Uh, there were a couple scenes. I don't know if you saw them, but like the opponents would launch themselves into the air. And as they pass each other, they're, they're sword fighting. And to do that, it was like, you kind of get that thing that you see in uh, anime where the, the backgrounds are rushing past uh, the right, guys. Like, ah! Yeah. 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 But yeah. they do that in this movie. I was like, uh, is that an animation thing? Or is that from Chinese uh, martial arts movies? Cause well, I think that's I, an I animation my, thing. I guess my question would be like, how, how much would anime influence? Like, I don't know the history of anime. Like when did that become big? When would that have been around enough to bring that kind of influence? Because as far as I know, anime 
became a big thing like in the 90s as far as my knowledge of it yeah i mean it was bigger i mean it was big in japan but i think being imported over here throughout the 80s because i remember stuff like lensman and robot carnival and akira i think was one of the big but i mean obviously they'd been doing it you know prior to that but i'm just yeah. I, i'm curious about that visual style because i don't know if i've seen that in other um martial arts movies but i mean it's an interesting i mean basically what you put your actors on some kind of a platform and you slide them or you're sliding backgrounds past them so they're in i was gonna focus. say you could you could probably just do that with backgrounds and shit yeah um, you might even be able to rear project on that and there's the big showdown between Lo Pan and uh, Egg Shen, and they use uh, it's peasant magic, right? Is he kind of he's uh, giving him a slur, right? Peasant magic and his like Chinese black magic, and they project uh, the Schwartz right at each other. <laughs> My dragon style will beat your kung fu. <laughs> and there, we see like uh, Chinese in full armor. Uh, warriors like fighting in this kind of silhouetted light storm. I'm like, this is fucking cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they, they achieved they achieved the body glow like in the yeah. last dragon. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> was that eighty six? Yeah, was no, eighty five. So there's this is in the wind, right? Like the uh, <laughs> yeah, it's out there. It's out there in the in the public. If you know, if you know karate or or, or, kung or bring, anything, you I will glow. Flat- can I bring back the last dragon and watch it again? Can we do that one again? <laughs> you got, you got like at least three years, Holly. No way. It's been Sorry. like three years. That was like one of my first movies I brought. Was it? All right. Well, you still got some time. And you got to achieve the glow. Right. Right? It'll go fast. Show enough. Then. Yeah. Show right. enough. Listen to our last dragon episode for more on that. Um, Jack the Burton <laughs> actually does. Uh, he, he is the guy who kills the bad guy. Um, Right. So that's like oh, yeah. his major accomplishment in the movie because he's got quick cat like reflexes, which they set up in that first scene where Wang's trying to cut that bottle in half. Jack Burton can c- catch a knife that's thrown at his head and whip it back at you. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool, too. It's a good, it's a good moment. I like that when you're just uh, especially when it's done. It's kind of a low key way for the bad guy to go out. But cool. It's just like, oh, I guess uh, Jack Burton really is that badass. At all a certain in the point. reflexes. Yeah. Yeah. At some point, all this bravado and all that actually does kind of pay off. That he's the guy who, I guess, saves the day what? while Wang is <laughs> busy fighting the three storms or whatever. Yeah. Well, when, again, uh, Wang's background work phenomenal in this movie. Mm-hmm. When he's just he's flipping around when Thunder's chasing him, and he's flipping around in the back in the in the thing, and then Thunder runs after him. It's pretty did funny. You like the, did you like the look of the the big bad? Yeah, he wasn't very men- because he wasn't very menacing. So, did you like? I liked his- it. Did you? <laughs> yeah, I liked how like stylized this movie was. Oh, for sure. Yes. Yeah. The only the only thing I didn't like, and it's not because I didn't like this part of the movie. It's a personal fear of mine was the long fingernails. Oh, I'm yeah. really freaked out by long fingernails. <laughs> it was just a uh. pinky though. They were just coke nails. No, they were all long. Yeah, but the, them, but they, they were long, but the pinkies long. were like, super, not, they were like, the pinkies claws. were say, like not, three inches longer than all of the other ones, though. You're not supposed to be able to fit a line of coke on your pinky. I don't think that's <laughs> how that's supposed to work. Right. The pinky was like talons, but the, the regular fingernails were long too. And that freaks me the fuck out. I hate long fingernails. So I thought it was terrifying. Yeah. How do you wipe your ass with fingernails like that, man? <laughs> you don't. Oh, thank you, get thank shit you for that. Your image. That's but to his credit, you, he Michaela. can't shit. He's Thank a ghost you. at that it's point. It's a fact right? of life, Sean. It's <laughs> this a fact is of true. Life, <laughs> Not for ghosts, Michaela. He's a ghost. Yeah. Sean, think about that now. Every time you go on a date with I'm... a girl and she has really long fingers, <laughs> there's probably <laughs> shit under those fingernails. Jesus. TMI Thanks, on Michaela. the Saturday night for this is why you listen to our show to learn That's something. That's exactly why I don't like long <laughs> fingernails because it's, a it's fact, really man. disgusting what gets caught under <laughs> there. You know, like, like this is true. I mean, yeah. yeah. It's you're asking for a fucking disease if you have fingernails that long, man. Yeah. Uh, you heard it here first, folks. Women are gross. Um, <laughs> um, they have guys many also secrets have to long tell. Fingernails. Ugh. I mean, it's yeah, it's disgusting. Yeah. See, too young to die. Was it what? Never too young to. What's oh, that yeah. John Stamos yeah, movie? Yeah, never too young to die. Yeah, it's got that. Sure. <laughs> it has the really long coke uh, fingernail too. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> which i'm sure see that that's the other one that's eventually. on the list <laughs> it's yeah. the saturday night freak show i saw that trailer it's coming <laughs> <laughs> um 
Uh, yeah, so they they do save the day. They escape, and uh, Chinatown explodes in blue f- or green flame. I'm not sure if that was entirely true, but um, uh, Jack Burton doesn't kiss the girl at the end. Um, uh, Total baller. He yeah, because it's like, is this a Han Solo move? You're not even gonna kiss her, and he's like, no. I like that he thinks about. It. He's like, nope. Yeah. Uh, Badass. We really run to go the- out. Pillars of heaven, or shook the pillars of heaven, didn't we, Wang? <laughs> you know, <laughs> this guy's got a bunch of great lines. He's got some good a, lines. Yeah, it's yeah. a it's a good character. Um, good lines that come out of Carpenter films. Yeah. Um. Well, I guess uh, unless you have any stray observations before we head into uh, telling you if we would recommend our final reviews. I um, liked the last shot of the movie a lot. Oh yeah, what happened? The little monster hand reaching up through his truck. <laughs> yeah, like a that Twilight Zone ending. Yeah, that was great. Why? Why did they never? It seems like, especially with the um, the ending of Jack getting back on the road in his truck. Why? I wonder what happened that they didn't make more of these. Like, well, obviously it was a flop. So you know. Yeah, I guess I, I is that I, the only thing. I thought I heard that there was a sequel in the works, and that ultimately it got passed on. Like something about it uh, was like not i think the version that was being shopped around it was a very pc and this was like in the 90s when things were becoming very pc that's what i recall reading but i could be wrong well there was for a while um i i can't remember if there was a big trouble in little china too but there was a remake uh the rock was supposed to be in a remake and i don't know if they're still talking about that to this day but they were basically going to take the title uh, change everything because they didn't what i heard was they don't want to you know um uh walk over the kurt russell jack burton character they wanted to yeah. create like a new guy same title and a you know chinese mysticism yeah. in so san francisco so basically leaving it open for kurt russell to make a cameo right yeah yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. i think so <laughs> exactly you, you know yeah. hollywood the rock doesn't need to be in everything he doesn't need to like eat up every fucking property like Disney man. Like who? Who'd have thought the fucking Jesus. rock? Well, I think that's be. what they do, right? They they buy properties and then attach an actor to it, and then that actor gets oh, yeah. to sit on it and kind of develop it for a rainy day or something. I don't know, but yeah, uh, yeah that's been that's been going on forever. Actors are like, hey, you buy that, I'll star in it. Let's do this. Yeah. So there may be a remake at some point of Big Trouble in Little China. I know. Uh, Tita Watiti. Taika Waititi, he said that this movie was a big influence on um, Thor Ragnarok for its tone, you know, yeah, uh, having basically a buffoon as your um, a lead character in a movie. So, I mean, it does have, you know, I think that's the thing. When this came out, it made like $11 million and The Golden Child made like $100 million. But which one of those have you seen and which one is fondly thought of today? You know. I mean, yeah. I I finally think of the Golden Child, but <laughs> not in the way they want me to. <laughs> Coming soon to the Saturday Night Freak no, Show podcast. No, 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 no. Although we should get Nettie Murphy movie on here at some point. Is that possible? Vampire, Vampire in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn? Yeah. yeah, that's the only one. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, well. Uh, we're going to take a break here to read some of your mail, uh, and then we'll come back and, uh, and review, the, review the movie. But to, uh, to do this, we're going to need the assistance of our mailman. His name is Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Well, thank you, Igor. Thanks, Igor. Yeah. Igor, where do you? Where are you at in the basement? Like, I'm curious. It's it's taking you a while to get up here. Like, I keep him in a secret room. <laughs> Sean's having to clap multiple there's, times to get him to go. Yeah, yeah. like I, I'm not supposed to actually get up and go get him. I don't know if you know this, but there is a secret elevator behind Sean, uh, behind Colin's laundry room. Mm-hmm. It goes really far down. It's got one button, and it just goes down. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we should probably tell the good folks at home how they can participate in this part of the show by following along on our social media. You can find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash night freak show and Twitter at sat freak show. You can email us Saturday night freak show at yahoo.com. 
And you can follow along on Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show about last week's episode, which was our best and worst of 2020 episode. Uh, Matthew Seidel writes in and says, because we broke it up with, and we did like different sections. And one of them was the new to me section. And he says, my new to me prime discovery was the strangeness it's a sort of a low budget alien slash thing homage set in a mine but with a stop motion creature and 70s bigfoot documentary vibe wow that sounds awesome that sounds great. <laughs> we may have to called? investigate it's called the strangeness, the strangeness. from 1985 mm. Um, it sounds it sounds almost too perfect like <laughs> what what's what's the catch what's like the catch? a night clause it sounds like a night clause situation yeah, like, sounds it awesome on paper yeah it's like yeah. how come we haven't heard of it is it but he said yeah. it was new to me discovery so there you go um peter get uh so we were talking on that episode about like our guilty pleasures peter get says i've always taken offense to the term guilty fe- pleasure why feel guilty over something you enjoy instead tell me exactly. about innocent pain but speaking of hate, <laughs> night Because claws. people make fun of me for liking Spice World, Colin. That's why. <laughs> Your yeah, innocent like, pain. The that freak you show is a uh, is a is a guilty pleasure free zone. You will not be shamed for what you like here. Yeah, this is a safe place. Unless you like all the Tremors movies. Well, unless you haven't, unless you haven't seen something, then we'll get on your ass. All right. Well, uh, Peter also says, speaking of hate, night claws. Sheesh. Who do I troll over that one? Yeah, that's uh, that, that was me. Holly. But um, that's all I'm, our fault. I'm not gonna fall on that sword. Everyone encouraged, encouraged me. Yeah, yeah. Everyone we'll all, encouraged me. All right, me. fine. We'll all just stab each other a little bit. I, I was I was scrolling the IMDb and found it, so I'll take responsibility yeah. for that too. Yeah, that was a team effort. Good, good job, guys. Well, uh, Travis we all lost Legler. together on that. Travis <laughs> says uh, rewatch. He's rewatching Ash versus Evil Dead again because of you, and I love you for it. So there you go. There you go. Good call. Yay, good. I, I read these out of order. Here's our big trouble in Little China uh, mailbag. Uh, Nelson Nascimento says, I can't think of a better way to start the new year. Big trouble in Little China has everything and anything you could ever ask for. Have you paid your dues, Jack? Yes, sir. The check is in the mail. Um, Michael Whitaker says, uh, the movie has been a favorite of mine since middle school. I can still remember watching this on VHS at my best friend's house. I'm convinced they use the storms as inspiration for Raiden from mortal Kombat. Totally. Uh, Simon Carter says, fuck yes. This is one of my favorite movies. Kurt Russell's performance is amazing, but I can't put my finger on why I think it's the way he manages to pull off being a total ass. That is also completely lovable in his own mind. Jack Burton is a God among men. And I think a lot of folks could benefit from that kind of thinking. Adam Kaler sure. writes in and says, Jack Burton is the king of surprised astonishment and driving his truck in a narrow one way alleys. I would love to see a Jack Burton and Ash Williams, Ash Williams versus the killer clowns from outer space movie. Oh Yeah. We That'd were saying cool. we were watching this. We want to cross over with Lincoln Hawks from over the top. The two truck drivers. There you yeah. go. At it. But yeah, that I guess, be... you know, he says that it's like Ash Williams and Jack Burton are kind of the same, right? They're like do they're from the same cloth. Yeah. 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 Very similar. Uh, Amos Martinez writes in and says controversial opinion, but this is probably my favorite John Carpenter film. Jack Burton is the greatest yet most useless hero in film history. I don't think that's very controversial. I can see why this would be a favorite to be revisited more than most of them. 20 years ago, that would have been a controversial opinion, yeah. but not yeah. anymore. Even, I, I think even with this, most people like, even if you, hey, what's your favorite John Carpenter movie? I, don't, I doubt this one comes up a lot as compared to what else he's produced and what most people know, I would say. But ironically, this is a movie that a lot of people like who don't know who John Carpenter is have seen this movie. I've yeah. right. had conversations. I'm like, oh, yes. yeah, Big Trouble, Little China. Um, yeah. Like Army of Darkness. People have seen that. but They haven't seen the other Evil Dead movies. Right. Yeah. Army uh, of Darkness <laughs> is the one that gets to everybody, no yeah. matter who you are. Um, the previous week, we watched a movie called Night Claws. Uh, Michael Whitaker says, uh, oh, because we were talking about um, one of the stars of the movie was Sherry Rose. We said that she had appeared in Black Scorpion or several of the Black Scorpion movies. One, two, three, and four. Uh, Michael Whitaker says, oh, God, Black Scorpion. I'm convinced that the movie was just a porno that forgot to film the sex scenes. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, probably, yeah. 
I'm mean, only one way to find out, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's I'm not, true. I'm not taking that bullet. <laughs> uh, Simon Carter says, "Oh, oh, we were talking about uh, Leilani. Um, so, oh man, she was." Right. The anthropologist. I'm sorry. I totally forgot her name and should have had it written down here. Unprepared. Oh, Bad yeah. Colin. Yeah. Bad Colin. Uh, but she was yeah. also no. in uh, uh, Basic Instinct <laughs> and Simon Carter. Do you have Carter. to beat you again, too? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Colin. <laughs> Leilani Celine or uh, something. Um, anyway, Simon Carter says, oh, I remember her. I'm pretty sure she and Miss Stone are the good reason are the reason for my poor eyesight these days. Shocking. The so VHS uh, really wore out the tracking <laughs> at that scene, huh? <laughs> he, he, he wore out a lot of things, it sounds like. Leilani Sorrell. Leilani Sorrell. Thank you very much, Captain Google, yeah. for the rescue on that embarrassing faux pas. Uh, <laughs> Mike Welch writes in and says, do you know that Reb Brown, he's the star of uh, Night Claws, worked with Christopher Lee twice, first on Captain America 2, Death Too Soon, and then again on Howling 2, Your Sister, is a werewolf and he also says on a side note captain america 2 was split over two weeks and was the lead-in to the salem's lot miniseries in 1979 on cbs that is yeah. very interesting red, yeah. red brown ha- isn't famous but man he's had some fun hasn't he it sounds he that way. right he's been places <laughs> he's had some fun <laughs> why is he not hitting the convention circuit so hard you know that's what he should be doing yeah he yeah it's your poster of night claws signed uh the previous week i think i'm not entirely sure now it's all blending together it was 2020 and it's in the rearview mirror we watched a movie <laughs> called blood beat um oh. okay so keeps we were, coming back we were posting some photos on social media because on that episode we said at the end of the movie um uh, two of the siblings unite to use their magical powers similar to the guardians of the galaxy to ward off the evil samurai suit of armor and grant Parrish wrote in and said don't don't bring the guardians into this this isn't their fault you can't blame the guardians for every sean movie can you is this a new get out of sean free card no there's a, this is not a pass for sean <laughs> i love our listeners taking him to task though <laughs> Yeah. Can I get a get out of Sean free card? I don't know when I'm going to need someone to no, get out of me, we, but I'll we take one. We get the, the get out of Sean free card. Uh, I think that's how it works. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, Can we word it differently? <laughs> <laughs> Can we retitle this somehow? I, I love the first draft like recommendation. Let's let's get it back into the writer's room. I mean, and let's, do hope, let's hope that it's applicable to demon possession, Sean. Let's just I'll take that. Yeah, yeah. I'll take okay. that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. We can we can write in fine print. That's fine. Okay. Well, we uh, hypothesize that that movie was made under the influence of cocaine or something. Stuart Dees writes in and says cocaine is a hell of a drug. Yeah. Um, hell yeah, sir. Hell yeah. <laughs> Bill Hainer writes in to say, I just tried watching this on Shutter. No, just no. <laughs> you are correct. No. Yeah, you, you are, are correct. correct. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. New year. We're making better decisions. Peter Gatt says he's just about near the end of Bloodbeat. Gee, it was a tough to watch. Uh, David Lynch films make more sense. True. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. they do. And uh, Pat Hetfield. Or Pat Hatfield, sorry, who has been watching our entire uh, or listening to our entire back catalog. Uh, Pat's a Amazing. new listener. Wow. So thank While you very much. The McCoys. Uh, yeah. Uh, Hatfield. Sorry, <laughs> I mispronounced it. Um, but and we are reading your comments, Pat, but we can't read them all here. But uh, he said about Bloodbeat that it sounds to me as if this movie is making you all give up and want to call it quits. I would ask you, please continue to power through. I don't want to see this show end. And if you ever get around to watching and reviewing Turbo Kid, I'd be greatly appreciative. <laughs> if we look, we came back strong after Shocking Dark. We came back strong after Bloody. It's not nothing to worry about. It's fine. <laughs> okay, okay, we can name some pe- uh, movies some other people picked. Holly, we could be fair here. I regret nothing. Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> Well, speaking of, wait, no, who picked this? Uh, uh, so about the oh. previous, 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 previous week's episode, Night Killer. Uh, Steve, oh, yeah. Steve oh, Carney geez. writes in and he says, I'm a first time listener here. I enjoy listening to your podcast, guys. I'll be checking out more episodes. Night Killer is so much fun as far as Italian horror goes. It's nowhere near as good as Suspiria, but it's not as bad, bad as Paganini horror. And my favorite line is when the killer says, I'm so horny. 
My what? favorite what? is fried chicken and French fries. <laughs> oh, God, that movie. Well, I, I mean... Aside from being Italian, I'm not sure how else it's comparable to Suspiria, but welcome to the Freak Show family. Yeah, welcome. Thank you for listening. <laughs> a hell of a way to come in. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad we've snared you. And so now, yes, that's right. And we're sorry that that snared you. If that's the bait that got you in, oh boy. <laughs> no, Night Killer was awesome. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm sorry, Night Killer and Night Claws fade in. Right, no, right, Night right. Killer. Are you, Night are you going to finish right. off your Night Trilogy, Holly? Is that the minute that you can oh, do one more? You mean right? Night Watch, the, like, German horror right. movies? There you go, finish off your Night Trilogy and uh, okay. finish it off well. Challenge accepted. <laughs> okay, you got a month. Well, now we're going to go around the table and we're going to tell you what we individually thought of tonight's movie, Big Trouble in Little China, and we're going to start with... Michaela. <laughs> Uh, what did you think about tonight's movie, uh, picked by our loving audience, A Big yeah, Trouble uh, well, in Little China? First of all, I'm surprised that they're being so nice to us again this year. After last year, they were very kind to us. So I was like, they, mm-hmm. yeah, they were. They this let us year, off easy. Like, night, between Night Claws and Bloodbeat, we're going to get it. I was like, <laughs> but so far, they're being really nice. Um, I just want to say at the top, I, I like, I know, especially with the rumors of a sequel and stuff, there's been a lot of talk on is this movie insensitive or, you know, potentially problematic? I don't feel like I'm educated enough on Asian American, Asian stereotypes to comment on that. Um, And if you, but if you feel it is, then, then that's your interpretation and that's valid. Totally. Um, I was kind of watching for things in this movie, but like I said, I'm not super educated on that. So I don't feel like I can really speak to it honestly or truthfully. So just don't think we're just, glossing over that and not thinking about it. I just right. Don't know we just have, about it. yeah, we have no, I have no idea. Yeah. Somebody else has to tell to me if there's a problem with this movie. And that's, I forgot. That's what I was coming in this going. I haven't seen this in a long time. I don't know if there's anything in here that I missed. Yeah. Or, that's what yeah. I was concerned about. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it, what's interesting about this movie is like, like the no sex scenes, like the, the way the violence is handled and stuff. It feels like this movie could be rated like PG almost. But that's, I don't mean that as like a bad thing. Like it's, it's very interesting the way those things are handled. I think, mm-hmm. I mean, Kurt Russell's always charming and a delight to watch and everything he's in. So that's a great start. Um, I, I think that, you know, this isn't like a movie I'm super familiar with. This is like the only the second time I've watched it in like 10 to 12 years, probably. Yep. Um, but I understand why people love it. It's a really charming movie. It's a really fun movie. It's a colorful movie it has amazing set design. Like it does some really cool stunts. There's a lot of underwater stunts and just really interesting kind of like fantasy elements. It's, it's a pretty fun movie and it kind of goes some really weird places. Like the first time I watched it and that monster showed up, I was like, okay, I don't know what this is about, but I'm into it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I feel like that's kind of the thesis of this movie. I don't know what it's about, but I'm interested, you know, I love the Lords of death gang. I think they're dope. I wish they were in the movie a little (laughs) bit more. (laughs) Um, I feel like Kim Cattrall is a little wasted in this movie because she doesn't have much to do and she probably only has like 10 to 12 lines the whole movie. Um, But yeah, I don't know. I I like this movie a lot. If it's your favorite Carpenter movie, I totally get it because I think it has a lot of rewatchability and it's it could be a pretty comforting movie if you grew up with it. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, like when I say it feels like a video game, I don't mean that as like a slam. That's just like how it's structured and how like the action feels. Um, I think this movie really highlighted to me how poorly directed a lot of action movies are now um like you can actually see what's happening and follow the action and like they shoot it in wide shots and not extremely shaky close-ups and they're not afraid to like follow one person through a scene and things like that it's action movies now look like shit compared to 20 30 years ago so i would definitely recommend it strong recommend it's a good listener pick i'm i hope we did them justice and what they wanted to hear us talk about uh, definitely recommend Big Trouble in Little China. Holly? Yeah, um, honestly, I think you I think you really summed it up well. Um, this was also my second time watching it. My first time was about 15 years ago. I was dating someone that couldn't believe I'd never seen it, so I watched it then. Um, and I remember liking it at the time, but I, um, I didn't remember my reaction very well until watching it tonight. And... Um, I really enjoyed this movie a lot. And I, I agree with you, Michaela. I think it has, it has great rewatchability. Um, a lot of times I think Carpenter movies don't necessarily have 
the pace that this movie has as far as like entertainment value. It does move quickly. It keeps your attention. Don't make faces at me, Colin. <laughs> I'm sorry. But some Carpenter movies drag. I'm sorry, but it's true in my opinion. But I didn't say all. I said some. Anyway, um, I, I, I agree with what you're saying, Michaela, about like how it's it could be a PG movie. It's one of those things where like I was watching it as well thinking, wow, this, there's really not like a ton of blood. There's not a, like, there's, there's fight scenes, but they don't feel super violent as a, like compared to some things that we've watched. There's no nudity, like, but you don't really notice it unless you're looking for it. You know what I mean? Like just as a whole watching it, you don't really notice those things. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still, it's, it's a great movie. It's, it's fun. It gives you like everything that you're like, it, it gives you a lot of surprises for sure. Like if you don't know anything about this movie going into it, you're going to get tons of surprises and they're all good. It's just, it's fun. It's goofy, but in like a really good way. Kurt Russell is charming as fuck and he's, he, it's a great character. Even like the dialogue sometimes is so cheesy that it's delightful. It's just, it's a fun movie. Um, I can see why it's a cult classic. I can see why it's a favorite of most people um, that like the, these types of movies. Yeah, I I enjoyed it immensely. I'm glad it holds up. I was really nervous watching it tonight. I'm like, oh shit, am I going to go into this and be like, I don't get why people like this movie. But um, yeah, it's still it's still a lot of fun. And there's a reason that it's still a favorite. So yeah, I definitely recommend Big Trouble in Little China. Sean, what do you think of Big Trouble in Little China? When I think of Big Trouble in Little China, um, I'm, I'm with you guys in the same boat as far as uh, I saw this. I remember this, certain parts of this from when I was a kid, especially uh, Thunder blowing himself up at the end. Like, those visuals have stuck with me. The ending of this movie, I've seen a couple times. Like, I remember it specifically. Um, it's the beginning parts that I had not um, ever caught up with or haven't seen in, like you said, 15 years. It's been a long time. Um, so tonight going into it, I was, uh, I mean, it was interesting. I wasn't exactly excited to watch the movie. It's never been one where I've been like, like, I need to watch Big Trouble in Little China again. It's just, you know, it's been kind of, yeah. Um, uh, watching it tonight, it's, um, uh, I did, I had fun with the movie. I think it's a good movie. Um, there's, uh, everybody is pretty charming. Um, I mean, I, I like all the actors and everybody's doing a pretty good job. Uh, Kim Cattrall is kind of, it's, it's weird. Like they really should have like cut one character and made her something else in this movie. Um, I think she could have done, I, she probably could have done more and, and been part of this or she could have either done more or been cut out completely, I think. And that's not based off her acting. It's just based off of, I think what she has to do in the movie. Cause at a certain point, um, you know, she kind of keeps herself out of the action and then she's out of the action as being held captive by, low pan and all that stuff so mm, kind of mixed on her in this um but it is when it comes down to it it is a fun movie um it does take you places you're not expecting to go like i forgot about like how many actual monsters are in this movie yeah. and it's it's fun when they start showing up because like you said when the claws start coming out when little orb alien eyeballs start floating around like you know it's fun it's good stuff um the three storms i mean that's good the the that first fight I thought was really good. I was really entertained by that. Uh, I was surprised by the movie. Um, it's again, not my favorite Carpenter movie. I like Holly said, I get it. If you really like this movie, I can see those elements. Um, it's not one I'll be going back to soon. I think like, it's just, I'll, I, I saw it good. Um, I'm sure it'll be like another, like five years before I give this one another watch. It's still entertaining. Um, so, uh, if you haven't seen it, you should probably give it a watch because it's, it's good Carpenter. It's fun movie. Um, and again, you know, last collaboration with Dean Cundy and everything, but it's, it's good enough. I definitely give it a recommend. I had a good time with it tonight. Uh, Colin, what did you think about Big Trouble in Little China? Don't tell us you hated it, please. No, I think this is, uh, the last great John Carpenter movie. And when I say uh -huh. great, I mean like, uh, movies that transcend genre audiences, right? Like, you know, a lot of people like uh, In the Mouth of Madness or They Live, but I'm going to say that those movies, like y if you're a horror fan, you'll like those movies. Yeah. You know, or Prince mm -hmm. of Darkness or something like that. But Big Trouble in Little China is a big mass audience movie. Um, I think it is, you know, like, you know, as I was saying before, after this, his career 
uh, takes a different tra- trajectory. You know, they say he was disillusioned with Hollywood. My guess is it's a bomb and he couldn't get a job, you know, and then jumped at the offer for complete creative control with uh, a live films or whatever for his two picture deal over there right. that he did next. Um, I don't think he came back to Hollywood till um was it memoirs of an invisible man which seems the least john carpenter movie maybe that uh you know that he's ever done you know like a high, it feels like a hired kind of thing his career is yeah. at a low point um <clears throat> but um yeah i keep going back to this movie all the time i think it's uh a rollicking adventure uh this is a movie it never stops uh entertaining moving forward uh jack burton is one of the great time uh, great all time uh you know like just comedy action heroes and i think you know comparing him to uh evil dead's ash williams is um you know appropriate because that's the kind of vibe that you're getting off of this guy the dialogue is very snappy um i guess it's a credit to the writer it's kind of got that howard hawks kind of um his girl friday i mean it's like really um that's what kim cattrall brought to it yeah. i think she had that snappy mm-hmm. like yeah well oh, we're writing a new story let's go boss. yeah like that kind of rat a tat to it yeah and if, i i was i was impressed to learn that kim cattrall was also working full-time on a um a theater production during filming this so she would leave the set and go to work at her other job so I'm I'm impressed with with that in itself. And her other job was a play by Chekhov, if I if I remember oh. reading correctly. So she was like, Chekhov and Carpenter <laughs> yeah. in the same year. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's was a it's gun? a movie. I think like a lot of John Carpenter movies. I mean, this is the curse of this guy's career, right? It was ahead of its time. It was a movie that he made that you know nobody appreciated when it came out and has found its audience, you know, and continues to live on. And uh, you know, just by the fact that we got so many votes for it, uh, and our listener poll, you know, kind of tells you that like the appeal of this movie is huge, and um, you know, people are still very entertained by it. I mean, I personally love it. Uh, I would uh, I watch it again any any day. And there's always something new to appreciate. You know, it seems like uh, character delivery here or makeup effect there or camera you know technical thing uh here uh, you know there um and yeah i think it's uh it's kind of progressive in its um depiction of like a chinese american experience in uh in in um in America, I guess, or the Chinese experience in America, because it gave a lot of Chinese actors, I think, roles that they didn't have, you know, I mean, because basically uh, we said Dennis Dunn is the hero of the of the movie, you know, and 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 the and Chinese villains and all of this like mythology that's just kind of like imported. And I like that, you know, we're kind of given that Western character perspective going into it who has to kind of like you know sort through all this stuff and see what's going on and you know just bewildered befuddled and out of his depth and i think that makes for a funny um a funny for some right there we go i'm like giving you my five cent uh french word there so yeah i would anyway i would <laughs> recommend uh <laughs> big trouble in little china you're sean. so classy colin <laughs> <laughs> sean what are we watching next week I have no fucking clue, Colin, Colin. because you, <laughs> you will never tell us. So, Why don't you Colin, tell us what we're watching next week. Yeah, that's right. It's going to be a surprise. Okay, so here it comes. So, number two, the most, the second last year, I think we did this backwards. We, we did this backwards. That's what I was going to say. Our, we yeah. worked backwards. Yeah, we blew our wad right at the beginning. Yeah. So that was the most, uh, the one that got the most votes. The second one that we're watching next week is 1987's The Hidden. I don't know what that is. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Really? Oh, my, I, oh God. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, this so is this good. is a, a very popular movie that apparently has escaped the Saturday Night Freak Show crew. So we will be watching The Hidden. Um, All right. Next Should week. Interesting. Uh-huh. Good one. I've never heard of. I heard of. I like that. Okay. Really. This surprises uh, me. I'm, I'm going to go look up. The, I've never heard the, of this either. I don't know. I'm going to go look at the poster and a, and uh, uh, see who's in it, and then probably be like, "Oh yeah, the yeah, yeah Right I now, so. I have no idea. I was going to say, shockingly, I have heard of this. I've just never seen it. Okay. All right. Well, that's next week on the Saturday Night Free Show again. Thank you for uh, your suggestions and for voting. And yes. uh, until next week, the basement is going dark.